there's two people who are still connecting to audio, so I'm going to give them a few seconds to tune into the audio. Welcome, Shira Fruchter, and welcome, Nechama Felder. Happy to have you with us. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you after class. So welcome, everybody. Uh, feel free to have your camera on or off, however you feel comfortable. Um, my name is Jonathan Ratner. My wife and I founded Somit, which has been rebranded as CareerWise, and we started CyberWise around seven years ago. So I'm going to tell you a lot about what we do and what the course is about. Today's class will not be a typical class. I'm not the teacher of the class. I'm the educational director. Um, so I, I usually come to class to just watch and make, keep my hand on the pulse of things. But the teacher is much younger than me and much more technical. I'm going to tell you about him today. He's a veteran of the Israeli army. He's a really cool young guy. Um, I'm not a cool young guy. If anything, I'm a cool old guy. Um, but that's, you'll decide if I'm cool or not. Okay, I'm going to try to do I want to put on my presentation. Okay, and I'm going to move that over. Okay, so today we're going to talk about cybersecurity and about the class, but I'm not going to, I will teach you a few things about cybersecurity. But again, today's an introduction and an overview. And we're not going to go the full five hours, so you can breathe a, a sigh of relief. Uh, maybe you knew that already from my email. Um, I have Mincha at quarter to seven. I expect to be done by then, and we'll have a break. But so uh, an hour and a half should get us through everything I want to share with you today. And then next week uh, will be the first week that the teacher really dives into the material. So who are we? What do we do? Uh, Some careers. My wife is a career counselor. Both my wife and I have master's degrees. Um, as I said, we call it CareerWise today. We have a, a nice website. You could check it out, careerwise.info. It's market-based career counseling and training programs. We have a number of training programs. We have something called DietWise we gave uh, for people to become diet coaches. We've taught people to teach English over the internet to Chinese kids. Um, we teach a, a number of different fields, but we have focused on cybersecurity over the past seven years because it's a great opportunity, as I'm going to explain more uh, as we as we go. So how did we get here, particularly to cybersecurity? So when we deal with clients and helping them pinpoint their own strengths and figuring out who they are, their skills and personality and inclinations and what makes them happy, we look at that. Those are in, internal factors to a person. And then there are external factors of you know, what jobs are hot? Where can you get a job? Or, you know, how is it going to pay? If you, maybe you like flipping hamburgers, but, you know, it only pays minimum wage. So maybe you should become a chef and you could do well. Um, what are your expectations and your values from your yourself and the community? Are you looking for full-time, part-time? You want to work from home? You want to go to the office, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of factors that go into the question of, you know, what should I do with my life? And so, we found that cybersecurity has a good answer for a specific type of people who are smart and ambitious and ready to learn. Um, so we do training and placement. Our value proposition is we have a really deep understanding and respect for every individual. And we have developed over the years really valuable connections to industry. We know people who have cyber companies in the New York area. Uh, we've placed people in Denver and in California and in, in Chicago and all over the place. And, and in Israel especially, we have a number of companies that turn to us uh, to supply them with talented and young people ready to enter the field of cybersecurity. Um, I, I'm not a technologist, so I'm, I'm warning you today, and I'm sort of, you know, I'll be tough about this. Don't ask me your questions about the course of how do I do this and how do I do that because my answer probably is I don't know. Um, I'm not into technology in that way, the bits and bytes. I've worked in the field of cybersecurity. I'm gonna tell you more about that. Um, I love technology because it's great what we can do in, in many fields, including cyber, but the fact that we can be together this morning if, between New York and Ramat Beit Shemesh and Yerushalayim is really a wonder of modern telecommunication. 
but I sort of hate technology because it's so frustrating and it doesn't always work when you want it to. So um, it's important that you like to work with technology because you know this course is, is a technological course. It's hands up, fingers on the keyboard and doing stuff with your computer. Um, what I did in the field, I was more in the strategic marketing and business development aspect of it. And I was working with a company that had biometric um, identification technology on a smartphone. So your smartphone would take a picture of you and listen to your voice and determine that it was really you. And we offered that to city banks. So before a person uses their card at the ATM, the app would determine that it was really them and not someone else stealing money from their account. And I, it was a great honor and a really wonderful learning experience. This was almost a decade ago already that I spent six months working sort of in Citibank's technology lab in Tel Aviv. It's, they have an accelerator there for young companies. And while I was there, um, I met another company who I ended up working with for about a year. And that company is called Cyber, uh, they're called Six Skill really. And Six Skill is the name of a shark which lives at the bottom of the ocean. And you're gonna learn in this course about something called the dark web. The, the internet and the World Wide Web that we're familiar with and that Google indexes is just part of the internet. But there's a real lot of stuff that's, there's something called the deep web and something called the dark web. And so you're gonna learn about anonymity, ways to be on the internet without anybody knowing who you are or where you are. And the dark net is a key component of that. But you can imagine, even though it was founded by the good guys, by the US Navy, to sort of cover for their spies or for dissidents in hostile countries, but it's used by the criminals. The criminals who are selling, whether they're selling weapons or drugs or human um, you know, limbs, they're doing all sorts of terrible things. They get together on the dark web where nobody can find them. And so that's where the bad guys hang out. And so the good guys need to go there to see which credit cards have been stolen, what are the next attack vectors that the bad guys are going to use. So Six Skill is a young company that I was with the two founders of the company when they were just the two of them. And they had a great idea of like going down into the dark net and finding out who's who and people are, you know, it's not easy, but they, they mapped, they sort of mapped the dark net and were able to extract information to provide what's called threat intelligence to Citibank and to the US government. And so they've been funded now with you know tens of millions of dollars. And the head of Six Skill is my buddy. He already cashed out and he's retired essentially as a wealthy man. And the company continues to grow and prosper. So that was my one of my experiences in the cyber industry. And this is my buddy. Um, what's his name? Avi Kashtan is his name. And he was selected as one of the top 10 most innovative and promising digital initiatives of the year um, in partnership with UNESCO. So they're, they're really a world-class company um, that I was privileged to work with for a year. So I attended some cyber threat intel workshops in Washington, DC, and it was fascinating for me. And I'm gonna share some of that fascination. And one of the things at that time, my wife and I were already looking for answers, where can we help Haredim um, enter the workforce, um, particularly the young women in Beis Yaakov who get a great education, but like they don't all want to be kindergarten teachers or necessarily computer programmers or special ed, whatever. So we needed to find more ways to train them to enter the, the, work, the work universe. And so we found that uh, cybersecurity is a great field with a huge shortage of talented people. So that's really why we're here. And and certain and I'm going to show you some of the people that we've trained and and placed in in this here. Here's my here's my graphic. So Cyberwise course and graduates for seven years we've been training ambitious individuals to successfully enter the field of cybersecurity. This is a guy from Lakewood, Moshe Sandrovich, and Tuvi is in Denver. Shia and Darren are both here in Israel. Um, Esther's in Lakewood. She worked for AT and T. Shifra has now moved to Israel from Brooklyn. Uh, Hannah Kay lives in Beitar Elite, and Naomi lives in Aramat Beit Shemesh. And these people today are cybersecurity experts who are earning a living in this field. I mean, it's not like we've only placed eight people, but these are eight of our stars and our great people. We have, you know, tens of people who have taken the course and entered, entered the field. 
Why is cybersecurity a good fit for our community? So there are a number of reasons that it makes sense. Um, this is me and my beautiful wife. This is one of our first students. This is one of our first teachers. This, uh, this is Shia and another guy. So there's a shortage of talent in Israel and in the international industry. I'm gonna show you some numbers pretty soon. The barrier to entry is only brains, is only skills. Brains is sort of a, a funny word. It's skills, the know-how, how to do stuff. Namely, no college degree is necessary. So if you have a college degree, or even if you go get a degree in computer science or, or even cybersecurity, that's all well and good. But really, the way to get a job is to know how to do stuff. And you can learn how to do that stuff, of course, in this course and through continued studies, which are online. So you have the capacity to excel and to succeed in this field without anything external to yourself. And because it takes brains and it takes a certain sort of mindset and a certain sort of mental toughness, we'll call it. So there's a high pay. There's a relatively high pay, uh, pay range. I'll show you about that also later. After relatively short education, like again, if you want to become a lawyer uh, or an accountant, you're going to have to you know, do a three or four year degree. Here we're talking about a year of training. And uh, in the next year, you could you know, get placed. And you're not going to start at a really high salary, but you're going to move up really fast. Because the work is, is online, you're looking, you know, you're watching what's going on the internet and analyzing data and so forth. A lot of the companies will allow you to have flexible, even work from home possibilities. A lot of our students um, have hybrid jobs or totally work from home uh, situations. So that's why this is a really good fit in our community, because as you know, family life and being a mother or a father or an Avreich Koilel, these are important things to people in our community. And so uh, there's a really good match here. This is my lovely wife again. She's speaking here at Tel Aviv University with one of the cyber gurus of Israel. Um, we're really, we're well entrenched in the cyber ecosystem in Israel. As you know, there's a war in Ukraine and Ukraine is actually a, a source for cyber, you know, human resources. But because of the war, unfortunately, these Ukrainians are trying to kill Russians and defend their country. And so it intensifies the war for tech talent because a lot of the Ukrainian talent are on the run or in the war or whatever. So there's a very real opportunity here in the world of cyber. Okay, this, I love this. Um, Haredi women leading the cyber world. It, it sounds almost like a dream, but this, this is a woman named Hannah Neuberger, Ann Neuberger, and she's a base Yaakov woman. I mean, the truth is her, her father's a billionaire, so that does help, but she's really smart, tough cookie. This is one of our students. Her name is Hannah Kay. Um, she acts as an advisor and we work with her. So um, Ann Neuberger is the highest has the highest position in cybersecurity in the Biden administration. I mean, she's not a Democrat necessarily, but she's senior White House cybersecurity official. Uh, let me just tell you what it says here. This was, uh, she came to Israel and was presenting, and so Hannah took a selfie with her, which is fun. Um, after the invasion, Russian hackers compromised several important Ukrainian organizations, including nuclear power, media firms, government. Senior U.S. national security officials said Moscow is now combining Russia's cyber and military forces. So we're gonna talk about that. We've seen the Russians having an integrated approach to using physical and cyber attacks in an integrated way to achieve their brutal objectives in Ukraine. So again, this is a Haredi woman who leads the free world in, in cyber. Here's another Haredi woman. Uh, she's, part of, she's a friend of ours. Her name is Olga Sergachev, and she works for Gardikor, um, this is her at our Hanukkah party a couple of years ago. Um, she's also a really smart woman and, and at the top of the game. Another, this is a Chassidish guy. He calls himself an Avreich uh, from Haifa. He's on Google's list of top hackers in the world. And you understand he didn't learn that in Cheder and not in Yeshiva Ktana, but he learned it on his own. He's inquisitive, he's smart. And so he has his own company now, which is called Reflectis. And I'm actually gonna share with you um, from Reflective's website, a little cartoon they have, because it explains something about the industry, then we'll talk about it. 
So here comes the video. Let's If anybody has any questions at any point, whoops, feel free to if you have to ask or put in the chat, whatever. Okay, share sound. Let's say you are a CISO. You successfully protect your website against advanced cyber attacks every day. You use the best security solutions, firewalls, WAF, IPS. You are fully secured. Or not? Meet your trusted friends, the web third-party components. These components help your company scale its business and technology. Social media, ads and analytics components, engagement tools, authentication apps, even the JavaScript code your developers download from various online sources. These third parties are already installed on your website, dozens of them, and they're managed remotely. Yeah, it means they can be modified without your knowledge and bypass your precious security perimeter. Groups like the MagCard hackers already exploit them, using them to extract business and private data, causing huge breaches and fines. And yet, the accountability is on your side. So, what can you do about all this? You could remove all these essential third parties or simply use Reflectis. Reflectees monitors your website, identifying the third parties that are already installed on it and analyzing their behavior, verifying that nothing is compromised, and easily helps mitigate your third party security and privacy risks from day one. And the greatest part? Reflectees is an external platform which requires no installation, saving you costs and unnecessary headaches. With Reflectees, you get full third party inventory and an effective risk mitigation for your website from day one. So, don't reinvent the wheel. Just use Reflectees. So, really nice cartoon um, of this company owned by this Hasidic guy. Um, and let, let me talk just for a minute about, you know, sort of what they were explaining in that commercial. That, let's say you were a hacker and you... But instead of a hacker, you're like a terrorist. You want to get into the airport um, and take it over. So probably to, you know, drive in with your guns, you know, coming through the front gate is not a good idea because there's all those people with machine guns at the front. Uh, so you want to come in probably in like a van through the back, like with the vendors who supply the food or the toilet paper or something you know, who they anyway have clearance to get into the airport. So the same thing is true of, of the hackers. They want to get into the website or the network or the app through things that are allowed to be in there. So they want to sort of hitchhike in um, through someone that does have per permission, but they put their malware, their bad stuff into it, and they're coming in through the back door. So that's what this company Reflect is, is able to diagnose and to warn you and, and to fix. So that's, that's how they're earning a living. So we're talking about essentially Haredim who are succeeding in the world of cyber. I want to show you a statistic now of who works in cyber. And it's not surprising that a lot of people who work in cyber come from the military or from like the police or from fraud research at a commercial company, 42% from the intelligence community. That means they work for the, you know, the CIA or the FBI or in Israel for the Shabak or something like that. But 34%, which you understand is greater than a third, they have no prior experience. And that's because nobody was born knowing cybersecurity. It's something you learn along the way. So that's what this course is about, giving you the know-how and the skills, the understanding and the knowledge to be able to enter the field. So I mentioned that there's a shortage of human resources, human capital shortage for IT security operations. Here's the numbers. The global cybersecurity workforce grew to encompass 4.7 million people, reaching its highest ever levels. That's the encouraging news. However, the same study found there's still a need for more than 3.4 million security professionals, an increase of over 26% from 2021. So it's still growing, 
The last time I saw a number like this, it was 3.2, so now it's 3.4. There's millions of unfilled positions in the cybersecurity ecosystem. And so, again, getting your first job is not easy, but once you get your first job and you grow your skills and become a more and more valuable professional because of the shortage, so the pay also is reflective of that. There's power with the skilled workers because of this shortage. I wanna talk about different personality types. Again, we're coming from the human resources, sort of the psychology background. So I'm more, I'm more interested in people than in technology. Um, so not everybody necessarily is the same type of geek, um, if you will. I wanna talk about four different personality types in broad strokes. Um, the yellow or golds, there are people who are like rules and regulations. If they're not gonna study cyber, they might study you know, banking or accounting or auditing, something like that. There are people who are hackers, red teamers. They like to break rules. They like to try stuff, take it apart and see if they can put it back together. Those are obviously very natural born hackers. Um, there are green people who are teachers and they like to train people and help people. So that's a different type. And blue people who are intellectuals, who are interested in research, R&D. I'm gonna share another video now that in the cybersecurity industry, there's room for all these different kinds of people because of the great variety of, of different jobs which are available. Reflect these. There's more advanced technology in your phone than it took to get America to the moon. The apps and games of today were the subject of science fiction just 30 years ago. But with technology changing so fast, it can be hard to know what's going to happen next or where the next threat is going to come from. As someone raised with advanced modern technology, you have experience that experts a few decades ago would never have imagined. And you're going to have opportunities to turn that experience into a profitable career. This presentation is a quick introduction to the growing field of cybersecurity and how to get started on the path to a cybersecurity job. Cybersecurity is usually defined as the use of techniques or skills to protect data, networks, and systems from attack. Everyone knows someone who's been hacked, or has had their identity stolen, or even just lost control of their Facebook for a few hours. And there's always bigger attacks in the news. Data breaches at major companies means that millions of people can have their data stolen and sold on the black market. Hackers can use this data to make money, find more data to sell, or even ruin their victims' lives just for the fun of it. That's where cybersecurity comes in. Cybersecurity experts are the ones who are able to fight cyber criminals on their own turf, stopping them from accessing important information and keeping people safe. There's currently a cybersecurity skills shortage in the United States. There simply aren't enough people to fill all of the available jobs, and the problem keeps getting bigger. See, hackers don't have to be smart. The internet is full of tutorials about how to use pre-made scripts and attacks to wreck someone else's day. Most hackers don't know a lot about computers and don't take time for special training or study. They just grab that pre-made script and go cause a mess. That means there's millions of low-level hackers out there. Cybersecurity experts, on the other hand, are fewer but more valuable. They've taken the time to study a problem and know how to use their talents. That means cybersecurity experts can be harder to find and they're desperately needed. Think of it this way, even if an enemy hacker is only level one, 50 enemies can still overrun a fortress. You need at least one level 50 cybersecurity expert to beat them all. Here are a few of the many kinds of jobs that you might see in the cybersecurity field. Graphic designer. Michelle is an artist. She works for a cybersecurity firm designing posters and creating eye-catching images to teach people about security. Social engineering trainer. Lee is an actor. 
He understands how to portray emotion and tell a convincing story, so he teaches other people how to tell when someone is lying or trying to scam them. Network Security Admin Joe likes puzzles and problem solving. She's good at spotting when something doesn't fit a pattern, so she monitors the computer networks and is the first to see when a hacker is trying to break in. Social Media Consultant Hendrick was on Tumblr before anyone else. He always knows what's trending before it even trends, and has seen all the scam emails and messages that get sent around. He works as a consultant, explaining the possible dangers of social media to people who don't know much about it. Ethical Hacker Adam used to want to be a hacker. Instead, he joined up with a security firm and became an ethical hacker, which lets him do the same thing legally. Adam's job is to play the role of cyber criminal, testing targeted systems and seeing if he can break into them. If you think cybersecurity sounds like a good fit for you, then great. You're in for a wild ride with a lot of challenges and opportunities. Here's a few things you can do to start preparing for a career in cybersecurity. Take courses online. There are a lot of online training programs like Coursera. Remember though that many programs are scams and don't offer real certifications. So always research the course and double check with your parents to be sure you're getting a real program. Practice, practice, practice. Play with code and talk to other people who are interested in computers and security. Find a mentor. Ask your teacher or a family member who knows about cybersecurity if they'll mentor you. See if you can arrange a visit to a local technology company and ask about what kind of attacks they have to deal with. You'll hear some good stories. Join a camp. Many organizations offer tech boot camps to teach you the basics of security, programming, and even ethical hacking. Participate in competitions. Challenges such as the Global Cyber Olympics will give you a chance to test your skills against other people of varying skill levels, and prizes include free courses, streaming video, and cash. This skills gap means that you have a very valuable opportunity. Chances are you've grown up with a PC, a smartphone, a tablet, or all three. If you're 18, you could have 12 years of experience using a computer, and that means you already know things that older generations have had to be trained on. And let's be honest, the money can be pretty good too. The one thing that most intimidates people about cybersecurity or any computer job is the idea that you need to know how to program a computer. While understanding and writing code can be very valuable skills, a lot of employers would prefer someone who's smart and willing to learn over someone who can do code and nothing else. Often, the answer is yes. A bachelor's degree in computer science, for example, can be very helpful in understanding cybersecurity. However, if you don't want to go to college, you can still learn a lot of things on your own that will make it easier to break into cybersecurity. Thanks to the internet, you have an incredible amount of information at your fingertips. Today we went over the basics of cybersecurity and cybersecurity careers. We reviewed what cybersecurity is and why it's a growing industry, as well as a few of the jobs that are open for different skill sets. Finally, we went over what you can do to be a part of the cybersecurity field. Thanks for taking the time for our presentation. So that was really a good introduction to the field and to about how to, and it's for different types of people. That's the main idea of that one. Back to my presentation. Okay. There we go. Okay, yeah, diverse branches of the cybersecurity industry. Like if you say you're going to learn accounting, so it's pretty clear what you're going to do as an accountant. And it's true there are different different niches in accounting, but in cybersecurity, there are very, very different branches of the field. So these are different domains of the cybersecurity ecosystem. Um, threat intelligence, which is, you know, researching the threats and providing information to the companies about them. User education, training others of awareness. Um, security operations, there's what's called a SOC and a SIM, um, which is you know watching the big screen to see what's coming in. 
career development frameworks and standards. That's a bit, we're going to talk more about that, that companies need to comply with frameworks and standards. And that's a whole branch of this um, of cybersecurity called GRC, which is governance, risk management, and compliance. Security architecture, cryptography, um, laws and regulations, governance, okay, that's where he has that, and risk assessment, uh, which includes, you know, red team and pen testing and so forth. So lots of different types of jobs for different kinds of people all within cyber. And, and our course, just to, so you understand, our course is a foundation pretty much across, across the bottom, building a solid foundation. So you'll know about all these different things. And then as at, over the course of the year, you're, you'll find out yourself what you're most interested in. Um, you have an opportunity during the year to do a number of projects. So you can focus your projects on things that are of interest to you towards uh, a, a possible career in that direction. And we're also going to talk about over the course of the year that even if you don't know at all what you want to do, um, and even if you want to do one thing, but your first job may be, let's say, as a SOC analyst working in a security operations center, which is a really good place to start no matter what you want to do, because it gives you a sense of what's going on and how the attacks work and how the defense works and so forth. So you don't have to decide so early where you're going to be or what you're going to do. But the main idea of this slide, which I think is beautiful, is that there's lots of different things. And so your workday is going to be different depending on, on which pathway you choose. Another nice thing we're going to do is we invite guests to our cyber class, people who are working in these different jobs. Um, last week, we had a guy who was in sales in the field of cyber. He took our course, and now he's working in sales. And he talked about where he wants to go and what he does. And so we're going to give you opportunities to interact with people who have taken the course and are working in different parts of the field to hear from them what it's about and what it would be uh, like to, to go into in that direction. So real pathways um, from CyberWise onward, what do our graduates do upon completion of the course? Um, so I, I have here six particular sort of job titles. The first being SOC analyst, I just mentioned that. This is like a SOC where, you know, there's screens and people are watching screens and what's going on. SOC stands for Security Operations Center. So it's like, you know, a situation room um, and people, there's level tier one, tier two, and tier three SOC analysts. Um, so that can be an exciting place to work. It can actually be a boring place to work. Um, if you have the night shift and not much is going on, sometimes uh, the, the company that's running the SOC offers 24 seven or 24 six in Israel. And so you may have, you know, the quiet time, but um, it's still a great place to, to learn what's going on in the industry. Cybersecurity researcher, we have a number of people who are doing that, who spend their time researching, researching attacks, how they work and how they're defended against, and then they're passing out that information to their company who's passing it on to their clients. TRC specialist, there's a woman in Beitar Elite. She's uh, working part-time for a guy who's actually in Lakewood, um, who has a company. And she is helping their clients to comply with all the necessary rules and regulations regarding cyber. Number four, incident response. Okay, the hackers have hacked them and they're, they've gotten in the system. Maybe they've sent them some ransomware. We're, we're you know, freezing up your data until you pay us $50,000 or $500,000 or whatever. Um, now what do we do? So there are people who are experts in dealing with that situation and responding to this incident. We have some companies who do that, um, who are hiring our graduates. Pen tester, that means penetration tester. Um, they showed that in the video. A person who's testing um, a company's app or website or whatever they have to see where, where are its vulnerabilities. And they document the vulnerabilities and give that information to the company so that the company can take measures to decrease their vulnerabilities. So that's like a, if, if you're really into technical stuff and you really want to hack, so that's like to work as a hacker is to work as a pen tester. And we have a, a bunch of people who have gone in that direction. The last one, the, the letter CISO stand for um, Chief Information Security Officer. You know, the head of an organization is called a CEO, a chief uh, chief executive officer, and there's a CFO, a chief financial officer, 
and lots of chiefs. And there's something called the C-suite, the corporate suite where the important people sit. And in the past decade or two, there's a new position has been created called CISO, which is the chief of information security, like the head person who's responsible for the cybersecurity of the business. So in a big company, there's a person who's really a CISO, and this is their expertise, and it's an advanced position. But lots of smaller companies don't need and can't afford a full-time CISO, but they do need someone who knows their business and takes responsibility for their information security. So that's the V here. V stands for virtual, to be a virtual chief information security officer. And we have a number of graduates who are really smart and rose really fast through the ranks to become VCSO. And so today they work for a small Israeli company who provides CISO as a service to their clients, which includes some really large Israeli businesses. So that's a really cool position because you're interacting with management, with the, the top management of different companies and helping them come up with their security posture of how to keep their data safe. So these are six real things that people who take our course are really doing um, upon the conclusion of the course. Okay, I have another video. I like to show you videos about sort of what is hacking. So go on that. Let me just see. Okay. Um, which of these people is most like a hacker, a burglar, a vandal, an inventor, or a spy? The answer completely depends on whom you ask, because the word hacker has taken on all of these meanings and more over the years. But it's the wrong question. It's like asking, is a chisel something you use to break into safes, to deface buildings, or to carve statues? No, the questions we should be asking are, what is hacking and why do people do it? In the broadest possible terms, hacking is creative problem solving that takes advantage of the properties of things in unexpected ways. So when Galileo used curved glass to magnify the stars, that was a hack. Or when NASA engineers saved Apollo 13 with a book, a plastic bag, and a roll of duct tape, that was a hack. Of course, usually when hacking comes up, we're talking about computer hacking. But the idea is the same. Computer hacking is just creative problem solving that takes advantage of the properties of computers and networks in unexpected ways. For example, phone providers used to use tones and beeps to get their phones to communicate with their networks. What they did not expect was that hackers would figure out that those tones could be imitated with toy whistles found in Captain Crunch cereal boxes, thereby bypassing the need to pay for the call. So why do hackers hack? Many are driven by intellectual curiosity. They want to learn how a system works to discover its quirks and hidden secrets. They are like cave explorers who venture into darkness and see what they can find. Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple, started out like this. Like many hackers, his early explorations inspired him to start tinkering and inventing. Other hackers are like the security forces who want to defend their fortresses of information. They find the chinks in the internet's armor, like the heartbleed bug, and patch them up before they can be used against you. And of course, there are hackers with less than noble intentions. They can be motivated by greed, fame, rebellion, or the desire to hurt others for cheap thrills. These are the hackers that media stories have taught us to fear. Some of them are brilliant minds gone astray, but many of these so-called hackers are just kids who run programs that they don't understand. Others are criminal syndicates that may know more about cheating and robbing people than creative problem solving. There are also hackers who operate in morally gray areas, who might steal information to expose corruption or violate privacy in the name of national security. They consider what they're doing just and for the greater good, while others see their actions as dishonorable and wrong. But assigning labels of right and wrong or good and bad to hacking is no more productive than pinning those labels to a hammer. It's how and why the hammer is used to build or to destroy that matters, and that you must choose for yourself. Hackers, like hammers, are here to stay, whether we like it or not. Like a hacker.
So did I mention that I sometimes hate technology? <laughs> I pressed the off button on my computer instead of the escape button and I got lost. So, but I'm back. Okay. I see Shira Abelow is here. Hi, Shira. Welcome. Um, okay. So we just saw an interesting video about why do people hack and what is a hack and what are hackers? They're creative problem solvers, but there's also a lot of criminals in it. And we're going to talk also about cyber war about hackers who work for governments and make uh, the world a very complicated place. So I'm just putting myself back over here. Okay. Um, so who are what are personality traits for success in this field as a cybersecurity professional? So curiosity, love of learning, strategic thinking, calm under pressure. Um, the love of learning, uh, which is really similar to curiosity, but um, because this is a, a living field, this is a field which is responsive to the hackers who are criminals who are constantly coming up with new ways basically to steal our money. Um, just to give you a sense of this, anybody who has a bank account or a credit card is subject to cybercrime. And so, and in terms of the size of the scourge, how big an industry is cyber theft and cybercrime, the answer is it's the biggest thing in the history of the world meaning the amount of money, it's not billion, it's not millions or billions, it's trillions of money that's being stolen using technology to take money away from us. So it's a really big deal and it's gonna to continue to be a big deal um, because think about a bank robber. A lot of people you know, don't really wanna work for a living, they'd rather take other people's money. So it's not so easy to take other people's money Let's say, you know, they asked one of the famous bank robbers, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, because that's where the money is. So if the money's in the bank, that's where I go to steal it. So the same answer is, why are people hacking the internet? Because the banks today are online and the, the money and business is online. So that's where you go to steal it. So if you're a bank robber, you probably have to carry a gun or something that looks like a gun. You may get shot at. And there's a good chance that based on videos and other technology, you're gonna get caught and you're gonna to go to jail. So that bank robbing is not that tempting to enter the field. The, the same is not true of hacking. Hacking, you can wear your pajamas, you can live in your mother's basement, you can you know sleep all day and you know work all night or whenever you want, and you can steal other people's money and you don't have to use a gun and you probably won't get caught. Okay, it's not that easy to catch the hackers. It's, it's easier to protect ourselves against the hackers, but there's a constant game of cat and mouse, of cops and robbers, of the hackers using new technologies to abuse them and take our stuff. And we, the, the moral people, the ethical people, we are the good guys in this struggle to protect civilization against the bad guys by learning the technologies that the bad guys are using and protecting ourselves against their exploits. So because that's gonna constantly change, if, if you think about how we do our banking today um, versus how we did it 10 years ago, in terms of depositing checks, for example, you take a picture of your check on your smartphone and you deposit it, lots of things that today we're doing that we were not doing a decade ago. So we could clearly predict that in an, another decade we'll be doing different things so the technology continues to progress and to evolve. And so it's new all the time and the bad guys are using the new things for their own purposes. So we, the good guys have to continue to learn um, the things we need in order to stop them from doing that. So therefore working in the field of cybersecurity is not like working, uh, lear learning to work in a field, let's say like accounting, because there you learn accounting, okay, double entry accounting, it's a debit, it's a credit, and then you know it. And it pretty much stays the same. But this is not gonna stay the same. Cybersecurity is gonna continue to evolve with new technologies. So if you love to learn, you love new stuff, and you're really into that, so then you're in the right place. And that uh, I'll tell you already, you know, to the end of the show, 
when you go for your job interview, that's one of the main things you want to say about yourself and you want it to be true, that you love to learn new things because that's what they're looking for. Because working in this field, you always have to learn new things. So the sought after cybersecurity skills are attention to detail, creative problem solving, and clear communication. Um, hard skills, information management, computer science basics, and then specialization in a subset. One of our teachers, and this is what I told you, I hate technology, because there's so much failure. So many times things don't work when you want them to. He claimed it's 90% and then 10% success. That's pretty awesome. Um, whatever the numbers are, the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. So one of the things you need to do is to be calm when things don't work and okay, we'll, we'll try it again. We'll figure it out. We'll troubleshoot. So that's important trait um, in cybersecurity. Nobody knows all the answers. So, you know, you troubleshoot, you think about things that maybe that's the reason why it's not working. You try to fix it and you move on. So I want to talk, uh, mention a little bit, but I want to go a deeper dive into the background of the industry. I talked about good guys and bad guys. Uh, here's about the cyber war between Iran and Israel. Um, it's not so covert, the cyber operations between these adversaries. This is a sign that was in Israel prior to the Six Day War. And uh, I'll read it for you. Kola Aretz Chazit, Kola Am Saba. The whole, all of Israel, the whole land is the front, and everybody in the nation is part of the army. So that's a very Israeli outlook, uh, where the, everybody's in the Miluim and part of Tzahal and so forth. And it's a tiny country so that everybody's on the front. But this is today the truth for all of mankind. And I'm going to show you some more graphics to demonstrate that. But basically, like I said, if you have a credit card or a bank account or any data about yourself that you don't want to share, so you are on the front because the hackers are going to steal your data and steal your money. So everybody is on the front, everybody who has an email account, everybody who has a bank account. And, and we're all in the army because it matters what all of us do as good citizens of creating secure accounts. Because if you don't have a secure account and if the hackers take over your accounts, it's not only bad for you, it's actually bad for everybody. It disrupts the system. And maybe, I don't know if I'll explain a, a DDoS attack today, but basically the hackers create like this army of sort of like zombie computers that they've taken over and they can use all these computers that they've put malware, they've put, uh, they've infected the computer with the virus and they can now use your computer against other innocent people and create this bombardment on a website or a program in order to bring it down. And they can do that to anybody. So by you not being um, cautious and careful with your own data on your own accounts, you're really giving more fodder to the bad guys. So there's cyber war, which is in effect today, certainly between Russia and Ukraine and the US and China and Israel and Iran. And there was something called a cyber caliphate. When ISIS was really big, they were doing a lot of cyber attacks. Um, so we're all on the front. We're all in the army of, again, civilization against those who would destroy it. We happen to be in a great place for that. We're in Israel, or you're in Brooklyn, or New York, or, or Lakewood, whatever. You're connected to Israel. You're taking a course from Israel. And Israel is the world's cyber capital. That's, I mean, that's a pretty audacious thing to say. But look at these numbers. The money raised um, in 2021 by the Israeli cybersecurity industry is $8 billion. But look at this percentage. 41% of cybersecurity firm investment around the world were invested in Israeli companies. I mean, that's totally nuts. 41%, right, more than a third, was invested in Israel of worldwide investment in cyber. So that shows you there's something going on in Israeli cyber that it's like a giant powerhouse, second to the US, when it's a tiny country. Um, a, a unicorn is a company worth a billion dollars, and over a third of the world's cyber unicorns are Israeli companies. And we're going to talk about why that is uh, later on. So Israel's a great place. And truly, the instructor for your course, he's, he's part of that. He's part of the great unit from the Israeli army, um, 8200, which is where a lot of this value has been created and this leadership in the world of cybersecurity 
it comes in Israel, a lot of it through this unit 8200, and that's where he is from. Um, I want to share more about sort of how the bad guys do what they do. I, I mentioned a DDoS attack where they're, they're bombarding a website with so much traffic that it can't handle all the traffic and it, and it crashes. Um, there's something called uh, SQL injection. They're, they're able to get into your database. Let's say you know, you're on a website and it asks you for your name. And instead of typing in your name, you type in computer code, which says to the database, erase everything in the database. So you have come in through the door, which was really open, and you've reprogrammed their database to erase itself. So that <laughs> you've hacked them. So the people who create that form, they need to be careful not to let you to do that. Defacement, going onto the website and you know putting up graffiti or saying you know death to the Jews or whatever. Account hacking, all different kinds of types of attack. And so again, I, I have now a great graphic that's going to show us how many cyber attacks are going on right now on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday morning in New York. This, um, this is a screenshot, but I'm actually going to show you a live one. Kaspersky is a leading cyber security company. <clears throat> and they, on their website, are showing live attacks. So uh, this is unbelievable. Watch this. Okay, so what we're seeing now, all these lines are cyber attacks, and they're different types of cyber attacks. Um, these are initials for them. But you see the kind of numbers uh, and how the number is going up all the time. This is real live data that Kaspersky is a company who is you know, watching the internet and counting the attacks and keeping track of them. And at any given moment, there's all the attacks going in all these different directions. These guys are attacking these guys and these guys are attacking these guys because there's hackers all over the world um, who are hacking different targets. Here it's talking about which country is being attacked. The country of Oman is 80. 82nd, Tunisia is the 50th most attacked country. More details. Detections per second. It's telling us how this is a cyber threat real time map. And it's showing us what they're, what type of attack they're doing um, with a virus, with a, a Trojan worm, etc. cetera. Um, just to give you a sense that this is happening and it's it's real live, it's right now as we sit here, the banks and and all of the, every company really, Israel's the 85th most attacked country, um, even though it's a very small country. And so again, you just get a sense that this is everywhere and it's constant, that there are attacks going on of one group against another, uh, bad guys against, mostly it's bad guys against good guys, sometimes it's good guys against bad guys. The US, of course, has a very strong cyber defenses, but also cyber offense. Um, so we're not going to go so much into offensive uh, cyber attacks, but we're going to learn how to defend against different types of cyber attacks. Anyway, it's a really cool thing that you could go online and actually see the cyber attacks in real time. So that's why I think this is really cool, and it's showing you what's going on. Okay. Okay. Another something I want to share with you now, and that is, I talked about being a responsible citizen and not letting the bad guys take over your account. How can you do that? I, I know before I got into the cybersecurity industry, I didn't think it really mattered uh, if you have a good password or a bad password, because I thought the hackers can get in anyway. But it's it's not really true. It's very important to have a good password. If you have a good password, then they can't get into your account pretty much. So what is a good password? 
And this is something, you know, even if someone decides not to take the course or whatever, this is something everybody needs to know. Passwords are important and strong passwords make a big difference. So th there's, there's some math, math involved here. I won't go deep into the math, but just think about it. It like a pin code that has only four numbers. So how many numbers could there be from 0001 to 9999? That's, you know, that's not that many numbers. That's um, less than 10,000. So there's something called brute force. And brute force means the computer will try every possible combination from 0001 to 9999. How long does it take a computer to try all those combinations? The answer is instantaneously. So if, if putting in a pin code of four digits, a computer could crack that password immediately. The reason, let's say, on your ATM card that won't work is because after you fail twice, they'll swallow your card. That's very important that they limited the number of attempts you can try. Otherwise, a person could just stand there if he steals your card and just keep putting in combinations until he gets it. But look at look at these um, at this data. Um, your your password could have numbers. It could have lowercase letters and uppercase letters. There's 52 of those, right? 26 and 26 plus 10 makes 62. But there's only four. There's only um, there's 62 characters, but only four in your password. So again, all the possibilities of the 62 characters, when there's only four in your password, a computer can do that instantaneously, even if you have numbers, upper and lowercase letters, and even if you have numbers, uppercase letters and symbols. Still, if your password is only five characters, that is not strong. But look what happens if you have, let's say, 12 characters. It would, and you have numbers in upper and lowercase letters, it would take 300 years. And if you have numbers and uppercase and lowercase letters, it would take 2,000 years. And if you have symbols, it would take 34,000 years for a computer to crack your password. That makes a big difference. A computer doesn't have 34,000 years to spend. The world's only going to be around for 6,000 years. So having a long password that has in it both numbers, lowercase, uppercase, and symbols, and you have a long enough password that you're over here, of, let's say from 10, from 10 characters onward, you now have a strong password. And so the hackers will give up on, your, on trying to crack your password and go to an account that has an easier password. The problem is, how do you remember your password when it has, you know, 10 or 12 or 18 uh, characters? You don't want it just to be your first and last name and your date of birth because that's something that, you know, that data is available online. So that won't take them 34,000 years to guess. It has to be something not easily guessable. So you want preferably something that's not a word in the dictionary. So I gave an example here of a password, very long password. It's Kalbachoymer ben Benoshel Kalbachoymer. Okay, and that's a, you know, that's a phrase that I know. My reminder of that phrase that on my computer would be 13 midois of the Yud Gimel Midos Shet, Torah Nidreshes Behem. And I'll remember that it's Kal V'choymer ben Benosho Kal V'choymer. And yet I've substituted some of the, the, some symbols or the S's and so forth. That's a very strong password. We'll learn in the course also about password managers where you don't have to remember so many passwords. You only have to really remember one. Um, and then you're they're like a safe where the, pa the password uh, manager, it gives you very strong passwords for all your different websites and bank accounts. Because they say passwords are like socks or underwear. You need to change them often. You should not show them to anybody. And what's the third thing? I mean, they're private. Uh, change them often and don't show them. I forgot that there's more. Anyway, so it's like your socks. You got to change them often and keep them to yourself. So having strong passwords is really important. I'm talking more about the cybersecurity industry. Uh, Deloitte is actually a company where we have people working, um, but I'm talking now about the impact of COVID, of Corona on the industry. So there's been an influx of cyber criminals, people who lost their jobs. They have more time on their hands than so they're doing hacking. There was a real lot of phishing and ransomware attacks. Phishing is, is when you get an email or a voicemail or something 
and it says, oh, you won a million dollars, click here to claim your prize. Oh, your rich uncle in Nigeria, he died and left you all this money. Um, just click here and give me your bank details and I'll wire you, you know, your half of the inheritance. So never click on that. Um, always delete that right away. Those are called phishing mail, uh, emails. And I get a real lot of them every day. You get things, oh, your package wasn't delivered, so click here to sort it out. Um, we're giving away free gift cards, whatever. There's a real lot of, it's a big industry of sending out phishing emails to get private information from individuals and then to you know abuse it and use that to get more information or to lock their data or they're just gonna sell your data, whatever. So COVID, another thing um, is that a lot of people now work from home or they work hybrid. Some days they go to work and some days they work from home. So that increased the security risk from remote working and learning. It's, you know, let's say at, if you're working at, at the factory or at the office, maybe they have a strong uh, sort of security perimeter where you work. But when you're on your own laptop at home, maybe it's not protected as well. So because of that fact, and again, it's created more breaches and more challenges to the cybersecurity uh, industry. Okay, um, one of the things that will be a good idea for you to do uh, oh, during the course of the year while you take the course and thereafter is to read cybersecurity news. And um, all of you who have registered for the course, I've invited you to the Slack channel. I, I hope that you've received that. I see a number of you have already uh, logged into the Slack channel. And there's a place there for cyber news. You read something interesting, please uh, feel free to, you know, put a link to an article, whether you're reading Geek Time or cybernews.com or other resources, some called Black Hat. So it's a, that's how you sort of get a feel for what's going on in the industry and in this, in this space um, by reading periodicals and things like that. Um, I mentioned both in terms of one of the jobs in this field and one of the drivers of the business. And let me just say that we have a business of providing cybersecurity services. We're, we're small, we're just starting out, but we have all these talented graduates who have taken the course and are working in the field and everybody's you know happy to put in a few more hours of work and put a few more shekels in their pocket. So we have people who are working on mostly pen testing um, projects for others. And the situation is such that a company needs to comply, let's say with SOX, which is a US law, or in Israel, the Chok Haganat Prat. Um, in Europe, there's something called the GDPR, which is about the privacy of information. There's something called ISO 27000, where that's a, a standard, you wanna have ISO. Um, HIPAA is health insurance. It's about medical data in the US. You're a doctor's office, a dentist's office. You have to keep your patient's information secure. You can't let somebody know that, you know, Mrs. Cohen, you know, has cancer, whatever. <laughs> so all these, um, these are rules and regulations, regulations and standards. PCI is, if you have credit card payments on your website, so it has to be PCI DSS compliant. So every company has to comply to relevant um, regulations and standards, depending on what, where they are, where they do business, and what industry they're in. And, and most companies, they themselves don't know what they need to do or how to do it, so they hire others to do that for them. And one of the obligations they have, for example, is to do a pen test, let's say every quarter or twice a year. And so they need to hire outside pen testers who will um, attack their website and show them the vulnerabilities in a written report. So again, that's room for business. That's the, the growth of the cybersecurity industry, which we are Baruch Hashem a part of. Certainly people wanna know how much money can I expect to make? So this, I, I got a great, um, a great mm, report called the State of High Tech, the 2023 Annual Report. So this is very recent data. And it's not about cyber per se, it's about high tech, which is computer programming and cyber is included in that. But this is just such an awesome uh, statistic. And I agree, it's, you know, for the Americans, the numbers are not the same. I mean, you make more money in America, obviously, um, but this gives you a sense of it. In 2022, 
the average monthly Israeli salary in high tech was 28,000 shekels, which from my perspective is a lot of money. It's 2.7 times higher than the average salary in the rest of the economy. So if you're doing anything not high tech, so the average salary is 10,000 shekels, right? And if you're in high tech, it's 28,000 shekels. So what I think that should say to you is, it's Kadai, it's worth it to work in high tech. So that's what our course is preparing you to do, to enter the world of Israeli high tech, to earn this kind of salary as opposed to this kind of salary. And of course, this is where you start, even if you start in high tech, but, but we have students who are earning these kind of salaries today because they're in demand, working for you know, world-class companies, doing really cool stuff. And so they're earning that kind of money. And you know, these are people that they were like renting and now they bought an apartment and their shalom bias is better because they're, they're making a bunch of money. So it's for real um, that it's, it, there's, there's really money in this field. Okay, I've reached a stage where I'm gonna talk um, a little more about the course and our expectations. I've sent everybody um, an academic uh, calendar uh, syllabus Part of that is that there's only three weeks of class until it's, you know, Yom Tif. Um, Rosh Hashanah is Shabbos and Sunday this year, so obviously there's no class in Rosh Hashanah, there's no class in Erev Yom Kippur, and there's no class on first day of Sukkot, etc. not the second days either. So basically there's a month off right after the first three classes. I will put up the syllabus again. I'll put it both in the Google Classroom, which I think I did, and also on Slack. Um, so one of the ideas is you're supposed to come to class, even though it's online, but you're expected to come to the Zoom meeting. If you can't come for any reason, I, I'd like to know in advance, please send me an email or tell me on Slack that, oh, I have a wedding or I'm traveling or something. You're supposed to be here for 70 or 80% of the classes. The Slack channel, I, I talked a little bit about it, is a place for us to share resources. I will upload this recording and every recording every week. Um, basically on Mondays, I do that. Um, and again, websites and things you find. That's a place to ask questions of the teacher. Um, I can't, I didn't succeed in doing this. How do you do this? We're gonna talk in a minute about what kind of questions to ask. And then there's the Google Classroom, which I've invited um, you to, which is where um, assignments are given and you, you turn them in, you upload them to Google and the tests are given there too. And Google like keeps your grades. So I have like a grade book there on Google. So it's coming to class, it's doing the homework, which is research and um, you know labs, activities. We, there are tests like on the various topics over the course of the year. There's projects, like an information security project, there's a Python project, and then there's a final project. We're gonna do soft skills training. Uh, I actually do that. I'm gonna teach you how to write your, your CV, your, your um, Korot Chaim. Um, I, I can't say the word this is in English, your resume, excuse me. I'm gonna teach you, there's, there's really smart ways to write your resume. It makes a really big difference if you do it smart or not smart. Um, so I'm gonna teach you that, how to conduct yourself in a job interview, how to use LinkedIn, basically how to get your first job. And it's important to learn those things. Um, at, towards the end of the course, we're gonna talk about you know internships or your first placement, um, certifications, well, I'm going to talk more about that in an upcoming slide, but there's basically international certifications in this field of standardized tests that you take. They cost a few bucks, um, and then you then you then you can say I have this certification, and that shows that you really know what you're doing. Here it is. Here's my certification pathway. This is just an example. This is a company called CompTIA. There are other companies offering different certifications. This is a good one for starters. Um, some places it's more familiar than others, but anyway, it's, it's a basic one, a good place to start. There's actually um, a certification called A+, which is just about like using a computer. It's very basic. And I, I wanna say about this, um, do you have to get certifications? The answer is no. And we've placed a lot of students without certification. And then maybe in the first year on their job, the company encouraged them to get a certification and maybe they paid for their certification. So you don't have to get a certification in order to get your first job. It will help for sure. It's an asset to have it on your resume. 
and to have it and to be able to tell people about it and so forth. You'll put it on your LinkedIn account and so forth. Um, but some people like to take tests and are good at taking tests and will right away want to get certifications. And other people, you know, aren't like that and they're less enthusiastic about it. So we have people who take these tests during the, the, the school year and finish the course with one or two certifications. And that's that's great. They're ahead of the game. And some people wait till the course is over and they have more free time. And that's when they begin to pursue their certifications. And like I said, there are different sort of pathways, different companies that offer certifications. Some of them are like real hacking certifications where they give you challenges and you have to figure out how to hack into something. These tests that I'm talking about right here from CompTIA are multiple choice questions, which is, let's, frank, let's say, be frank, it's easier. Uh, you could guess and you have a one out of four chance of getting it right. So anyway, th this is a way. Um, a, a, a first certification might be Networking Plus which is about sort of how the internet works, how networks work and so forth. There's something called the OSI model, different layers of the internet from the physical layer, down to transport, et cetera, et cetera. You'll learn all about it. And that's, that's like a key component of your knowledge about networking. And that's a very important to know whether you get the certification or not. And then the next one is Security Plus. Security Plus already has a lot of elements of what we're gonna study in the course about cryptography and just a real lot of things that we're gonna learn about. So this is a great sort of summary of the course. And I encourage you all, even today or tomorrow, whatever, go online. Um, you could use the Google words, cybersecurity certifications, and then and read about it and see the kind of things, you, you know, you'd say test questions and you'll see some of the test questions and it'll use a lot of terminology that I'm sure you don't know yet, but it'll give you a sense of where you're going and what you're going to learn about. There is then, here you see infrastructure pathway, cybersecurity pathway. Here's pen test plus um, about for penetration testers. I wrote here the CEH, we used to call our course the CEH. This is a security council, it's a different company than CompTIA, and they have a, this is a certified ethical hacker certification. So again, you would go online and you would Google it and see what are the advantages of the pen test plus versus the ceh and you make a personal decision which one you want or a different one so this is a personal decision but getting certifications is valuable towards getting jobs and even once you have a job your company will encourage you to continue learning and getting more certifications and it just makes you more valuable uh, i'll give you an example i spoke recently to a guy uh, from guy in lakewood who has a cyber company and I asked him about using our people to do uh, pen testing. And he said, well, send me a list of their certifications so I can see what they know. So having certifications is a clear demonstration of what you know. And again, it's very objective. You, you either passed or you didn't. We've had people who did not pass the first time and they took it again and they passed the second time. So again, it's, it's very real, it's very objective. I mentioned earlier that we invite people to class, the last half hour usually, people working in the industry, uh, many times they're graduates of our course, and they can share with you their insights in their journey uh, to success in the field. Uh, we think it's a really great thing. I have, you know, on our website, on cyber, cyberwisecourse.com, you can watch a lot of videos that I've already uploaded from past cyber stars. So those are encouragement for you. So take some time, if you're feeling down or you don't have the strength to learn, so spend a few minutes, it's usually 20 minutes or half an hour watching these cyber stars. You of course can put them into double speed and it won't take so long, but it's, it's very valuable. Okay, so I've, I've done a real lot of talking. I wanna talk now about some nitty gritty stuff and I wanna you know, talk tachlis and I call this our covenant. So what does this, this symbol say? It says no magic, okay? Uh, what I've showed you today, in my opinion, it's impressive, it's cool. We really have taken people you know, from our community who had no background, like many of you have no background in technology. You have some interest, but you've never worked in it, you've never studied it. And yet over the course of a year, if you really dive in and really do the work, 
really can become a professional in this field and earn a nice living for yourself. This really works, okay? We've been doing it seven years. We have 10 groups of people who are today professionals in the field. But it, I would be lying if I said it works for everybody, right? It does not work for everybody. There are people either that drop out or they just don't give it enough and it does not work. So there's no magic. We can open doors. We have a great teacher for your class. He's going to teach you everything you need to know, but you got to deliver the goods, meaning you got to do the homework. You got to come to class. You have to try stuff and break your head until you make it work. There's frustration along the way, but there can never be yevish, right? Ain't yevish but oilam. So you got to really work hard and become a cybersecurity professional, and then you can really do well and succeed. But I do want to emphasize there's no magic. You can't just come for a year to class on Sundays and think, oh, yeah, yeah, then I'll get a job in this. It won't work, okay? You got to work hard. It's hours during the week. It's a good idea to put in, whether you put in an hour every day, or you put in two hours, you know, four times a week, however you want to schedule your days and your weeks, but you do have to put in hours and hours outside of class time learning the material. So it's not like, oh yeah, five hours a week and I'll become, I'll, need, I'll learn everything I need to know. That is far from the truth. The truth is you have to invest a lot of time in watching videos and doing labs and challenges and so forth. Again, all the information is out there and really it's, it's for free but you got to do it and really challenge yourself. So we're, we've created an infrastructure. We're here with you. We're holding your hand. You have friends in the class. You have a teacher who's available to answer your questions all throughout the week, but you got to do the legwork. You got to deliver the goods. So that's my challenge to you. I'll ask everybody, who is your best friend? Okay, it could be your bestie from SEM. It could be your husband or your wife. It could be your mom or your dad or your Rebbe or your, your, your therapist, whoever is your best friend. From today, you have a new best friend. Who is your new best friend starting today? Does anybody know? The answer is Google. Google is your new best friend because anything you want to know, you Google it. Before you ask a question, how do I do this? Or I got stuck, what do I do? Don't ask me, don't ask the teacher, don't ask anybody. Google it, ask Google. Then once you try what Google tells you, if then you get stuck, so then you say to the teacher, and there's an ask channel in the Slack channel where you write, okay, I don't know how to do this. I Googled it and this is what I got. And this is where I got stuck. And then you send like a screenshot. So that's an intelligent question. But to just say, tell me how to do this, or how do you do this, that's laziness. That's not the way to go. Your new best friend is Google. Ask Google everything. And it's remarkable how much <laughs> Google knows, but in just in everything about life, you know, what should I do on my vacation? What should we do, Benazmanim? Or whatever, any question you have in life, you can be enriched by the information that is available to us on the internet. So Google everything in order to learn. Okay, this is sort of a humorous thing, but I, I, it's a serious idea. And these are Hebrew words that most Americans and English speakers don't know. And the words are fighter and fighterit. Okay, and it's a Hebrew version of the English word fighter. And they say about somebody like a soldier or somebody, or here's a karate person, who mamash fighter. Or you say about a woman, he mamash fighterit. So I want your new identity to be as a fighter or a fighter eat. And I have women who, you know, they have nine kids and they speak Yiddish and they wear a shaitel or maybe, you know, two coverings on their head, whatever, but she's a fighter eat. So she came into the course because she needed more parnasa and she's a very, she's a nice lady. She's sort of shy, whatever, but she is playing to win. And so she's a fighter eat. So she learned what she needed to learn and she today works in the field and she's doing great. I have a number of women like that who are really from women, they're really soft and wonderful, and their mothers have big families, but they felt the need, I got to do this, and this is a way to parnasa, and so I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it hard and winning and so forth. So that is the attitude you want. You want to be a fighter. You want to come in and fight, because this is war. We are at war against the bad guys, 
and you guys are turning yourselves into soldiers. You're not going to have to wear a uniform. There actually is one guy from Lakewood who he's actually working on a U.S. Army base. So I'm confident he doesn't wear a uniform, but I think he actually does drive onto an Army base to go to work. So we're part of the global challenge of saving civilization against the bad guys, the hackers, the criminals who are trying to steal, and we got to fight them. And so your mindset, you have to grow into this mindset of being mature and being a critical thinker and being resourceful, having self-confidence, being tough, mental toughness. You know, I, I'm not like that so much. When, when my computer doesn't work, like I'm ready to start to cry, you know, or I'll dive into Hashem. Those are not the right answers. You don't need to cry. You don't need to, davening's always good. But what you need to do is stay calm and figure it out and conquer. So I'm encouraging you to become a fighter. Uh, you don't have to actually study the martial arts, but learning cybersecurity is like that. Some people like to learn from textbooks. Um, I actually like that. There are textbooks for uh, the things that you learn in this course. This is A+, plus. I don't know why I put that one. The CompTIA certification all in one, the A+, plus. Um, but really I would say it's networking or it's really the next one. The CEH, um, Certified Ethical Hacker Study Guide. These are, these are books, again, that you could go online and buy them um, to help you throughout the course, but you don't need to. Um, it's just something you, you could do. The truth is they've been hacked, I'm sure, and you can, you can download them online for free. Anyway, um, here's a great online resource. His name is Professor Messer. And you go on YouTube and you do Professor Messer. And here's CompTIA, the A plus training, how to pass your A plus, laptop hardware, laptop displays, connecting mobile devices. Professor Messer is one of many good online resources. There's an ocean of information which you'll learn as you begin your career in the broad industry. Please share helpful resources with your classmates. So again, uh, uh, there's a lot of like watching and doing um, uh, on YouTube. There's a, just a ton of information. Sometimes the guy's speaking with a heavy in Indian accent and it's hard for you to hear. So, so turn him off and find a different one. Find things that you like. We've had a number of students who who have passed the Networking Plus or the Security Plus, and they recommended Professor Messer. That's why I pointed him out here. Um, Kahan Academy, I showed you one video from them today. It's very, very basic. It's like high school or whatever. But what is the internet? It's just a three-minute video. Packets, routers, these, these are all good things. Um, unit one, how the internet works. So again, I haven't I haven't like taught you stuff. Like I said, today's class is not like the other classes. I haven't taught you technical information. I've given you some exposure and overview from 10,000 feet up in the sky about the industry. Um, if you want to start to learn a little bit of you know the very basic technologies, so this is a good place to start. Um, Khan Academy, uh, lesson le unit one, lesson two, how the internet works, etc. So that's a good place to start. This is a joke to keep things lighthearted. Text, um, but this is, a, this is also serious. Tech support is a way into the industry. So I, we've had students that worked for, uh, there's something called TechLock, and what's the other one? That provides a lot of the Americans with their um, internet filter. I forgot what it's called. But we've had people who worked for them, and then they use that experience to get themselves further advanced in the industry. So, you know, coming into the industry in cyber is like the high road, but the low road, the pedestrian way is to come in through tech support or through being an IT professional. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good, really good way to start. This is just a, a, a great joke. I love this joke because, you know, people who are stupid tend to be stubborn. So a guy calls in and he says, you know, my computer's dead. It's not showing me anything. The screen is black. So customer service says, is it plugged in? And the customer says, duh, yes, what do you think I am, an idiot? But look how he plugged in his computer, right, he, into this power source that's plugged into itself. So the guy is, of course, an idiot, but he doesn't know that he's an idiot. And this is that the problem is between the keyboard and the chair. So that's, you know, that's, that's the way it is. Okay, I'm going to close our meeting in the next 10 minutes. I'm telling you about our faculty. I'm really proud of the high-level people that we have on our faculty. Um, there are two classes going on at the same time. 
because we have students both in Israel and the U.S., there's really only one time during the week that everybody can be online at the same time, and that time is Sundays, you know, from 5 to 10. So we have um, a class that started in February. They're in the middle of the class, and you will sometimes go into their classroom, let's say, when we have a cyber star that I want you to participate in. So I'll give you a link, and we'll all go into their classroom together. And the teacher of that class is a young man named Aaron Liebert. He's actually from Seattle. He lives now in Ramat Beit Shemesh. He is a pen tester for a company called uh, Accenture. He's a great guy. He's working for us in a, a number of ways, in pen testing and teaching. He's a wonderful uh, cyber professional. A woman who works as a VC so for CyberSafe. Her name is Leah Rosenberg. She taught a number of classes. I expect that we'll bring her also to share some of her knowledge with you. Shalom Banunu is an Israeli guy from Shmona Matayim. He's taught some of our Israeli classes. I showed you Hannah Kay today. She was with um, Ann Neuberger. She works with us and for us. She graduated our course and gives us guidance and technical issues. Many of you have had interaction with Deborah Erlinger, who also took our course and works today in recruitment for us, in addition to her job in the cyber field. Um, Shoshi Ryder works closely with me uh, for admin, and she's going to help you set up a payment plan uh, and so forth. So be aware that Shoshi will reach out to you. Uh, my wife is the CEO. She's the big boss. I work for my wife, Baruch Hashem, and I am, call myself the educational director. And as I said, I'll be hanging out. And I'm always here to answer your questions and to help you. I really want you to succeed. I really care, actually. And so never hesitate to contact me with any issues that you have. The lecturer for your course is a young man named Dori Alefandari. Uh, he's, he's a great young man. I, I've fallen in love with him. He's a friend of a previous teacher of ours, Omer. And they were both cyber commanders, which means instructors. Um, Dory was in unit, what we call Shmona Matayim 8200, and I'm actually going to share a slide about that unit. But you see here that Dory was an offensive cyber instructor, combatant, and developer. And he, um, this I like that he's an instructor for pre army service in charge of building and teaching educational classes for kids in the ages of 8 to 13. So even okay. though he's, you know, like a tough guy um, from Tzahal, but look, he's he's teaching eight-year-olds up to 13-year-olds. So he he definitely knows how to talk to all kinds of people on all different levels. He's again, he's a wonderful person. He's really, really smart. It says on his CV, he got 745 on his uh, psychometria, which is a very, very high score out of 800. Um, I did decide to include sort of the history of 8200, 80 because again, our instructor is from that unit. And so 8200, a lot of people have heard about it, but I, I didn't know everything about it. So it's it's from the intelligent core for clandestine. That means secret operations, collecting intelligence, code decryption, counterintelligence, uh, subterfuge, military intelligence, and surveillance. The central collection unit of the intelligent core. The unit. This is interesting. The unit is comprised. Oops, sorry of 18 to 21 year olds. It's all people in their first three years of service. So it's a bunch of young people. As a result of the youth of the soldiers in the unit and the shortness of their service, the unit relies on selecting recruits with the ability for rapid adaptation and speedy learning. Like if it takes them a few months to learn, they only have you know two and a half years to work. I don't know exactly why they do it that way, but it has to do with being open-minded and fresh heads and strong heads at that age, I guess. There are actually after school programs for younger people preparing them with hacking skills or coding that are feeder programs for the unit. Former unit 8200 soldiers have, after completing the military service, gone on to founding and occupying top positions in many international IT and cyber companies and in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. The list of companies that have been founded, by, like Wix and Palo Alto, a bunch of great billion dollar companies come from people who served in Shmona Matayim. According to the Director of Military Science in the UK, it's probably the foremost technical intelligence agency in the world. It's on par with the NSA of the US in everything except scale. Um, I, this also surprised me. It's the largest unit in the IADF, comprising several thousand soldiers. It's comparable to the US and uh, National Security Agency. So there's a several thousand 18 to 21 year olds 
who are like doing all this spying and technology stuff to protect us. It's really interesting. Um, you recall that Israel bombed Syria uh, already it's in 2010, so it's 13 years ago. Some of you were maybe in diapers. But anyway, um, this happened that Syria was going to develop a nuclear bomb based on guidance from the North Koreans. So Israel did not want to happen. So they bombed the place where they were developing it. And you ask the question, why didn't the Syrians anti-aircraft shoot down the Israeli planes that were destroying their early nuclear facility? And the answer is, again, this is not that we know it, but the New York Times said it from a former member of the US intelligence community that it was unit 8200 they used a secret kill switch to deactivate the Syrian air defenses during the operation, which was called Operation Orchard. So the Syrian guys who were sitting at their desks and they're watching the airspace of Syria, they were not seeing the Israeli airplanes. They were seeing clear skies because the Israelis in Tel Aviv and Unit 8200 had taken over their network and were showing them like a blank screen even though actually Israeli planes were bombing their nuclear plants. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and again, it's from this unit that Dory was in the unit and he was a commander of teaching people cyber. So he knows how to teach cyber. Many, um, something also very famous was the, uh, against the Iranian uh, nuclear plants, you know, developing the uranium and stuff. There was something called Stuxnet. And you're gonna learn in the course about a worm a worm is malware. It's like a program that gets into the computer and spreads from one computer to another and sort of messes up the computer so it doesn't work properly. So there was something called, they gave it a name Stuxnet that infected the industrial computers, including the Iranian nuclear facilities. And the Stuxnet was actually um, probably, again, I, I can't say that I know this, but it was created by the US and Israel in order to infect the Iranian um, centrifuges. So again, Shmona Matayim is at the center of Israel's cyber capabilities, and you guys are going to have the opportunity to learn from a commander in that unit, which I think is really great. Okay, I have shared with you everything I wanted to share today. Um, you're welcome to ask me questions now. You can put questions in the chat. You can send me questions by email or Slack, whatever. We are about empowering individuals for success. That's what this is about. We're going to lead the way. And you're going to follow and do the legwork. And to the, together, we could do really great things. I look forward to a great year of growth and development. You won't be the same person at the end of this year as at the beginning. Like if you're just sort of casual, I want to learn a little bit something about cyber. So this course probably isn't for you. This course is like hardcore. It's really serious. It's really demanding. You got to put in time. You got to do the exercises every week. There'll be homework and even more than the homework, you got to do research, read about things, watch videos and so forth. So again, you, you've come to the right place if you're ready to grow and learn and enter this field. Um, I hope you're ready to rise to the challenge and together, as I say, Bezrat Hashem will do wonderful things. So any questions? Uh, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Malki? Yeah. Um, my computer has a computer filter. Um, does that interfere with anything or is that okay? 